Hey guys, Jason Haber here for Future City. Join me today on our conversation with Aaron Block of Metaprop. Metaprop sits at the intersection between real estate and technology. This is really important for the future of cities because when we think about technology in cities, we think about roads, bridges, highways, aqueducts, elevators. But now we're talking about big data and the power that's in our hands to transform cities. I hope you'll join us and I hope you like what we had to talk about today. Aaron Block, Metaprop. Hey. So if you guys can't tell, if you're not watching, if you're watching this right now, we're some cues what we're going to be talking about today. One cue is we have laptops out in front of us, which normally I don't have. But the second bigger cue is we're both wearing vests. Gorgeous venture vests. What is what is the vest thing, by the way? I have no technology? idea. I have no idea. It's a New York venture thing. Is it it's just a New San York? Francisco San Francisco venture too. thing. It's a finance fella thing you just wear a vest and it's so warm and toasty Jason. <laughs> it just feels so good so i have a metaprop vest which i wear uh-huh. i'm wearing a different vest today but um it's like uh it's like a uniform yeah right it's a uniform for unicorn farmers oh i like that except it doesn't have a usually has doesn't have a unicorn on the back it just usually says patagonia or <laughs> <something like that. laughs> or uniqlo for, so, for us because we're cheap <laughs> so let me ask you so first before i get into the questions i have for you tell everyone what metaprop is oh great so metaprop we're or early st- yeah but, <laughs> metaprop but we're unicorn farmers now we're early stage venture capitalists we invest in property technologies the space is called prop tech it's the intersection of real estate and technology and early stage means we invest in technologists and entrepreneurs who are trying to take ideas that are disrupting or enhancing the real estate business from the very earliest stage of their ideas through what we call series a so we're series a or seed prop tech investors We're number one in the space. We've done 111 investments since 2010. We spent a lot of time finding those entrepreneurs, supporting them, and then helping them grow. And Mm -hmm. we work with big international real estate partners primarily, who are the sources of capital for our venture capital funds, to connect those entrepreneurs with those owners and managers of 15 billion square feet around the world and assist those folks with pilots, tests, and investments in new cutting edge innovative technologies within their portfolios or within their operating businesses. I think a lot of people think about real estate as almost like a laggard in technology, at least until recently. Was that the, was that actually the case? It like, still very much is. Uh-huh. Right? I mean, if you look at the data, we're at least five years behind financial services in the tech-led innovation. You can look at that from a variety of perspectives. The easiest proxy is probably venture capital investment. So the smart money coming into the technology side of the space, mm-hmm. we're still about five or seven, by some people's estimate, years behind financial services. I mean, think about it, Jason. When's the last time you went to a bank teller? When's the last time that you heard someone graduating from undergrad going to be a trader on Wall Street or in a commodities pit. I mean, financial services in the last 10 years has been transformed radically. Right. The jobs are different. There's new companies. There's totally digital efforts being done for, for consumers and businesses alike. I mean, some people don't even carry cash. Some people don't even carry credit cards anymore. And that's only in the last few four or five or six years that that's come about. Imagine the next four or five or six years in real estate, those types of transformations impacting the people, the jobs, the consumers, and the enterprises. It's a lot of fun. So in this space, what I want to talk to you about today is this idea of technology and how it can empower cities and how companies can help change the future of cities. When we think about technology in cities historically, we tend to think about things like infrastructure, like the aqueducts of Rome that would bring fresh water into Rome, early sanitation, then things like the elevator. You know, when the when the Brooklyn Bridge first opened up, there was a riot and people died. Why? Because when they walked on the bridge, they had never been that high up in the sky. And they couldn't imagine how they got very afraid and they went running. And so when we innovation usually historically has meant this sort of technological infrastructure. But the kinds of innovation that you're working on right now are, are in the palm of our hand. And that is transforming really with big data and some of the other innovations are really transforming or have the power to transform cities. I was wondering if you can talk about that. Yeah, well, I think I think the, your story about people running on the Brooklyn Bridge when that innovation happened because they didn't understand it and, 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 and there, was, there was drama going on because of technology and innovation still very much applies today. You're seeing 
enterprises, you're seeing cities, you're seeing institutions, government agencies, and others who are being affected by technology or new business models empowered or accelerated by technology mm -hmm. who don't really know what to do about it. I mean, the easiest case to talk about is WeWork that has changed the way offices are leased, are managed, are used, invested in. You know, all across the world, there are folks who own office buildings who are now absolutely petrified about what's next from a functional obsolescence perspective. Now, mm -hmm. now, if you own an office building, you're not necessarily thinking about a broader city context. But if you're a planner, I studied planning in undergrad. If you're an urban planner, if you're thinking about the future of our cities, understanding that these tech innovations may actually change business models, may make buildings that for the last hundred years have had a use or a purpose become somewhat or entirely obsolete, it changes your thinking. Autonomous vehicles, there's mm -hmm. so many things, right? Solar energies, battery power. There's so many things impacting the built environment and the real estate and the prop tech world right now and they're going to totally change the way we interact with these buildings. We're trying to invest in the ones that are changing that the most, including 3D printing and some other interesting right. areas. But all of this impacts the way we think about, plan, use, and engage with our urban environment. Right, because if people, if people are going to work differently, Right, that means they're going to they're going to trans they're going to be transported to work differently. Their their hours are going to be different. Um, how they work is going where they work is going to be different. And the challenge I think for cities is going to be if people you just want to we're going to all work from home and where that home is and are they going to commute in like they do today and is there a loss of tax revenue because people stay home and don't and don't commute in and what does that look like? I think a lot of the the things that you're working on at Metaprop easily relate to the future of urbanism in general. So it's these companies that are forging these new innovative paths, but then it's it, the broader question is, what does that mean for the city? And you've got a lot of interesting companies you're working with. Like, give us an example of, of one. So one, one of the companies is very early stage, uh, built by one of the top uh, executives from the traditional real estate industry. And this company is called Blueprint Power. And their idea is to uh, turn uh, large uh, class A and class B buildings in the urban environment into power plants so using their cogeneration, aggregating multiple large buildings cogeneration capabilities and selling that power back to the grid in a marketplace like environment so that you have additional buying power, additional selling power, and you have capacity. But explain cogeneration for people who don't uh, like, so like you have office buildings usually burn a lot of power right. over the years, various office, I'm using office buildings as an example, other asset types do as well. But large buildings generate um, and, and uh, power now because you don't want to be solely reliant upon one power source into the building. You frequently have one substation feeding power. You know, it could be a coal-fired or a nuclear uh, uh, reactor that's actually putting power into a substation. The substation is then directing the power to a building. Mm -hmm. Usually you need to have redundancy because there's critical op uh, actions and opportunities and activities happening in a building. So in the old days, you wanted to have two sources of power. In the new days, everybody has data centers or in the ha past before you know Amazon Web Services and right. everyone else came about, you were having huge data centers, sometimes entire buildings dedicated to data centers. And even if both of those redundant power sources fell apart, you'd want to have some sort of local power generation generation capability, which would be a diesel generator, maybe a natural gas mm -hmm. generator. And increasingly now with the improvement in the storage capacity of batteries and solar, you're seeing these buildings be able to burn fossil fuels and be able to create energy on site, right? Be able to take solar power and be able to generate energy on site and mm -hmm. deploy it and to be able to use other sources of renewables and be able to use them on site. And in certain cases, they have excess capacity that they generate on site. And that excess capacity can be stored and used at times of of high demand for the building itself, or it can be given back to the grid, back to the other uh, demand users across the urban environment who need uh, special power generation at the right time. So it's really, it's becoming a complex web increasingly of not just a single power generation, not just a redundant second source of power generation, but everyone starting to think about generating power and how does that all fit together and how do people make money if they've spent the capital investment into doing that. And there's been incentives for years for buildings right. to have cogeneration capabilities and now we're trying to put that together in a way that allows everybody to make money in a marketplace. I think like what's setting. interesting about that is it fits into the large larger conversation about uh, climate change and because buildings commercial buildings are responsible for you know almost 70% or something enormous amount of cities emissions come from 
the built environment and the office buildings. And so if you can make those office buildings more environmentally friendly, you're going to make huge progress in terms of making cities much more uh, you know, climate friendly. Sure, so energy efficiency is just one example and, and making the grid more efficient is one example. We've got technology investments in companies that are smart water valves, right? Like a company called Flow that's in partnership with Moen, you know, the, the, the mm -hmm. faucet company. Yeah. Um, so th they're allowing uh, buildings to be less wasteful from a water perspective, which is really important in urban environments that aren't as fortunate as we are, for example, here in New York, like in the West Coast right. where water is really scarce and in other markets where you really need to improve the life of all the citizens, particularly in a dense urban area, you have to figure out how to su handle supply and demand of, 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 of fresh water. So this is a way to make sure that water damage and accidents, which are, which are a statistical event in the built environment, right. there will be accidents, problems will happen, are minimized by being able to cut off the flow of water based on uh, sensors and valves that are all connected through technology. These are really cool, innovative, some of them very simple, some of them extraordinarily complex business models and ideas that are transforming our urban environment, not just today, but for the next 10 or 15 when years. I got, when I got involved about 10 years ago in the clean water crisis, which at the time there were about 1.2 billion people who lacked access to clean water, and today it's about 660 million or so. It's a lot of uh -huh. progress that's been made, but the problem existed almost exclusively in the developing world, right? What's happened over the last 10 years is we've now seen that problem happen in Detroit, across California, and other parts Newark. of Newark. Um, we're seeing a growing water crisis here in the developed world. Now, it's different, obviously, than, than there. However, it's real. And um, this is a challenge for cities now in the future because uh, access to clean water and access to sort of food are the basic essentials of life, and it's what all wars are fought over too. So um, there is a potential for huge strife and uproar unless we can get a handle on this problem, which is now accelerating here, and it's popping up in cities across the country. Um, I think that like things like that and thinking about our water supply are critically important, um, not just in the future, but really right now, because we're, we're, we're hitting a point right now where if we don't do something about it, um, you're going to have huge shifts in population, population decline in some cities, not to mention the health problems that come from uh, with water problems, whether it's unsanitary water. I mean, the poor people in, in Flint, um, when you saw what the water looked like that they were drinking and no one was telling them not to drink it and the health problems that came. And you're going to see in five and ten years from now, you're going to see people coming down with conditions because they drank uh, what was essentially dirty water. Well, you know, I, I think you and I have spent a lot of time together to know that we share some common values. We've worked really hard as a for-profit organization. We are not a social enterprise by any means, but we have worked hard to build some of those values that you and I happen to share. Yeah. I know my co-founders share into what we do as investors and things like uh, sustainability things like affordability. You know, we have a pretty high profile partnership with Enterprise Community Partners, the top um, affordability financing and advocacy arm in the United States. Uh, things like resiliency, right, and things like accessibility. Mm -hmm. We work those into our core values and we evaluate not just our people on those core values, but we evaluate our investments against those core values. It's really important to us to be a part of the solution, despite the fact that we're just venture capitalists. We think in the built environment in particular, we have a, not only an opportunity, but an obligation to do better and to help move the world to a little bit better place through our investments and through the growth that we provide and the connections that we make with industry. Would, would you ever take a social uh, an, an investment into a social enterprise if, if you thought it could be profitable? If it could be profitable, absolutely. Yeah. That would be that would be a huge win for us. And by the way, for many of our uh, limited partners in our funds, the largest real estate institutions, many of them have CSR, you know, initiatives, and many of them look to us and partner with us because this is so core and important to our to our investment strategy and to our operating business as investors. I think it's you know everybody's got their own flavor of ice cream in the venture capital right. space. We sure. happen to do early stage prop tech investing, but we do it in a way that we think is pretty thoughtful and in a way that's you know trying to do a little bit of good along the way. So I, I do a lot of work with, with Entrepreneur Magazine, so I'm always talking to different entrepreneurs, particularly very young ones, and they're always interested in securing money in that sort of pre-A seed friends, maybe is it, is it post friends and family that yeah, you're in, the, right? Like just the after. lines blur, and definitions yeah, blur. Right, so I, it's probably the hardest time to get money maybe because you've, you've kind of maybe proof of concept, but not 
certainly not profitability, mm -hmm. um, not yet scale, but maybe showing potential. Is that is it fair to say that's the space that you're in? Yeah, we do anything from from, from you know two folks with the back of the napkin idea, all the way through folks who have very clear what we call product market fit. Maybe have some uh, pretty marquee clients on board. Maybe have some revenue. Maybe approaching the concept of profitability, but are really looking to pour gasoline on their fire right. from a marketing perspective in order to grow their business while the opportunity is there. That's the range we play with the companies that are just getting formulated. Maybe a great entrepreneur with an idea who hasn't even filed for their you know, Delaware C Corp right. paperwork yet, all the way up to that kind of Series A where they have some clients, they may have some revenue, they could be profitable, but there's a much bigger opportunity if they had the uh, access to oxygen, oxygen in our world equals capital, to be able to grow faster. You're essentially invest. You're essentially always investing in the jockey, though, right? Always, always, always. This is a people game, right. no matter what. It's finance, but it is a people game. Great idea, bad jockey, no investment. Never, never, never. What about the reverse? Uh, those are interesting opportunities, and those right. play out differently over time. As uh, the top investor in the space, having been in so many deals, having seen, you know, we'll look it up to. 50 deals a week, yeah. right? Part of our job is to reconstitute opportunities into things that would be more successful. And that can be a financing round, reconstituting of the wrong approach mm. to financing a business into the right approach. It can be a team, reconstituting the wrong team into the right team, moving pieces around within the four walls of an organization or bringing in new talent uh, to create a new organization look from a human capital perspective or actually merging uh, two ideas that would have been great because one has a stronger team or one has a stronger product. You know, our job, you know, we're kind of the wizard behind the curtain right. in some cases because we don't frequently take majority positions, if ever, in these companies where we have to apply our experience, network, um, and relationships to be able to, to put some of these deals or ideas or people together in ways that they entrepreneurs who you know are pretty headstrong you spend a lot of time sure. with them otherwise wouldn't have thought of and so the nuance of being able to influence these folks at the right way time at the, doing it the right way in a way that actually gets the whole greater than some of the parts is a lot of our job in addition to just picking winners and i think that aside from the fact that a lot of them are wearing vests there's there's a there's a stereotype that a lot of them are also like 22 or 25 years old and like sometimes i meet entrepreneurs who are in their 40s, 50s, 60s, who think that no one's going to invest in their company because they need to have, like, they're not in, like, a vest or a hoodie and they haven't just graduated college three months ago. Is that the case? Well, the, the recent research, I just read another story, is that the most successful entrepreneurs are, are, are old folks. So, you know, <laughs> uh, I think I think a, a little bit of mileage on the on the vehicle goes a long way. Right. Um, there's Being an entrepreneur, as you know, you've been one, is really, really hard. Taking sure. something from nothing to pass the point of survival is, is one of the hardest things to do. Taking something from survival to good is a, is a whole different set of skills and requires an evolution in, in thinking um, and perspective. And then taking something from good to great, you know, and, and to market dominance, you know, these are all different phases of maturity right. of, of new organizations. And, you know, infrequently do you see the Mark Zuckerberg example of someone who's taken it the whole way. Very frequently it takes a different type of personality. And that's just one of the reasons why this stuff is so hard because the lead entrepreneurs have to be so dynamic mm. and have to be able to understand what is needed when how to push through all of these hurdles. I mean, you probably can think back when you started your company how many problems you came across yeah. just to just to get just to get the business off the ground. But I had experience with that because I had failed before. And I think that it's super helpful if you have failure experience. Well, back to our point, right, Jason? You're saying that the, the, the older entrepreneurs tend to be really backable and interesting. Yeah. Listen, we don't discriminate, you know, and, and I use that word yeah, yeah, right, yeah, 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 quite lightly here. You know, we we we, we pick people, right? right? We it doesn't matter what size, shape, color, geography. We're primarily focused on North America, just because that's where the most commercializable right. entities are. But you never know where innovation is going to come from. We talked to an entrepreneur turned investor the other day, who said um, that that the thesis that he goes for is, I'm looking for a first generation or immigrant founder who played team sports growing up and who was the captain of the team sport that he or she excelled in.
Wow. That is the best entrepreneur to back. And I laugh because if you look at our portfolio, there's a lot of that, <laughs> right? That's really interesting because I think that's actually uh, that's something to chew on for your listeners about what kind of resolve and determination and motivation is required, especially in the early days, to make uh, an organization uh, uh, find its early successes. And when you look at that kind of a person, to like, they, they come across demo, like demographic, gender, socioeconomic, like there's no, you know, it's not everyone who goes to Yale, right? Or no. everyone else to Stanford. In many like cases, it's, it's it's the opposite. Right. In many cases. I mean, Stanford being a glaring exception well, sure. of that. But, but I, that's I, like know, a we, magnet for them too, I think. I so think, you know, probably. you've seen and been a part of our accelerator program that we run. We're going to start up Accelerator yeah. with Columbia University. It's called the Metaprop Accelerator at Columbia University. We just launched our seventh class, if you can believe that. It's kind wow. of mind-blowing. Not a single white male CEO. No kidding. Out of six companies. Of course, this stuff is important, giving people opportunities, yeah. but we're venture investors. We're putting money on the line. The fact that right. there was a class that came together with that many women and people of color with diverse backgrounds and immigrants. I mean, we're, first of all, very proud of all of these entrepreneurs because they're building great, great opportunities. But it's also really indicative that you don't know where innovation and tech is going to come from. Right. It, it, there is no one size fits all. I was at a, I did an accelerator. I was a judge at a competition in Boston. This was like a year and a half ago. And the the finalists, I was there to judge. And there were six companies, and every company was uh, was he- spearheaded by either a woman or a person of color. I thought it was awesome. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. So it just shows you there's a lot of opportunity for everyone in the in the space. And I think that's so important now going forward too. Like we're in a very divisive time right now. There's a lot of different conversations that are very heated. And I think that um, these are the kinds of things we should be celebrating. And like our diversity is actually our strength. And when you harness the power of everyone, uh, everyone wins. Agreed. Um, I blame it, Robert Moses for most of the problems. <laughs> you know, and my guests know it. They just blame Robert Moses for everything. I know and how to get like on Jason's win. good side. <laughs> and then, you're, then you're booked for another one. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Aaron. This has been great chatting with you. So good um, to see thanks you. Thanks so much for coming by today. Keep doing your great um, work. So for, fe- for folks, though, who are listening to this or watching this on YouTube and they're like, hey, wait a minute, I have wanted to do this or that, be- what do they do? Metaprop.vc. Get in touch with us if you have an idea. And you'll really up. listen to them, right? Yeah, like if you're in the real estate technology space, hit us up via email. You can find us on the web, the World Wide Web, <laughs> metaprop.vc, M-E-T-A-P-R-O-P.vc. They don't call you because no one uses a telephone anymore. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah the volume of yeah, inquiries yeah, yeah, that we yeah, get I'm is sure. so high that, that, that usually uh, getting in touch by, by mobile web or email Do they need to have a deck ready or, or just a basic It really page, helps. Right? Yeah, it usually helps. It allows us to be able to give faster feedback. Like 10 quicker. pages of basic... Yeah, yeah. yeah, any template that you find online for a good uh, startup pitch is there. But if they're in the real estate space and they're entrepreneurs trying to light the world on fire, we're uh, we're the best uh, gasoline for their for their for their little uh, fire that I think is out there, and we'd love to help. We really enjoy helping entrepreneurs get to the next level. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. It's been great having Thanks, you. Thanks, Jay. Awesome. Good to see you. You too, man.